So in this video, I'm going to be covering uh, setups and also some basic electronic troubleshooting. Um, when I uh, get guitars sent to me, um, majority of the time when they say they need to have a setup or something along those lines done, it's usually maintenance. Um, consider it like a tune-up for a guitar that every, uh, not a guitar, but a tune-up for a car. And every now and then it needs to be cleaned. Every now and then things need to be adjusted. Sometimes you have a high fret or two. Um, sometimes you have to do a nut adjustment. Things like that. Um, but every now and then someone will also send a guitar in and they'll say, I'm having problems with one of the pickups. Um, or I'm having a problem with one of the potentiometers. It cracks. It makes cracking noises. Static. Sometimes people will say, I think my neck is warped. Or the string keeps falling off the side when I try fretting it. So in this video, I'm going to try to cover all that. I'm going to be doing a setup on uh, this particular guitar. This is a set neck. I'm also going to be doing one on a Fender Stratocaster. Now it's going to be a Squire, but they're it's all the same thing, okay? Um, and I'm also going to be going over a, a Floyd Rose bridge because people have a problem with trim systems for some reason. Now, first things first, let's say they don't tell you what string gauge they prefer. You have to figure it out. Now, they'll usually tell you, but what you can do is get a set of calipers, set it on millimeter, okay? Come over here and just clamp the high E. And then as soon as you clamp the high E, it'll show up right there. Now, I measured this before, and it's actually 10s. Um, it could be an 11, but this is, this is actually uh, quite smooth. Um, and if you go really, really tight on it, you can even get a 9 and a half. So figure 10s. You can also come over here to the uh, low E, do the exact same thing. And we're getting about a 45 and a half. So it's, it's 46. Okay, so a set of tins, a set of tins will be just fine on this particular guitar. And <clears throat> looking at this, I can tell these strings have not been changed in a long time. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take these strings off. Now this particular guitar, uh, he was not getting fret buzz. Um, he didn't say that there was fret buzz to it, so uh, I'm assuming everything is fine with that. But um, I'm also going to check the frets for level anyway, just to make sure, so I can lower the action as much as possible. So we've come to this point right here, and we have to ask ourselves, is it time to clean the fretboard? Anytime somebody sends me a guitar, I always clean the fretboard. Typically, I use naphtha, okay? And if you don't have access to naphtha, that's fine. Um, you can use Zippo lighter fluid. Now, some people will ask um, if you can use uh, things like uh, Pledge and things like that. I don't recommend it, okay? Now, naphtha does not damage uh, any type of finishes. So you don't have, if it's lacquer, you don't have to worry about it. If it's urethane, you don't have to worry about it. It also evaporates quickly and it doesn't leave a residue, okay? And I'm just going to go through this and kind of scrub gently on this, trying to remove any grime. Now, let's say, for instance, there's a lot of grime on here. What would be a way that you could actually remove a lot of grime? And you could use a razor. So you can get a razor if you see a lot of grime and come in right next to the fret and gently move back and forth, scraping away that grime. Now, you can do that, and that'll work. Um, generally, I, I don't need a razor, nothing, unless it has never really been cleaned in a really, really long time, typically you don't have to use something like that to scrape off a lot of the gunk. So what I'm doing is I'm just, I'm just going back and forth, trying to get rid of any type of um, dead skin cells, oil, things like that trying to get it off of the fretboard. There'll be some people that will, do it when they're doing setups, they'll have a call or something underneath here to hold the guitar up. 
Um, generally, I, I, on a setup, I don't see the reason for that. But if it makes you feel a little bit more comfortable, you can always just roll up a towel and stick a towel up underneath here to gently hold it so that way the weight of the guitar is not on the headstock. Okay? But I'm not pushing down on this. Um, everything I'm going to be doing is very gentle, so we're good to go. Sometimes you have to do a little bit of scrubbing. Some people will use a toothbrush. Now you can use a toothbrush, but generally I don't, I think just a regular rag does just fine. And it also is a little bit more delicate, so uh, you reduce the chances of leaving any scratches in the uh, fretboard. Uh, where a toothbrush, on the other hand, depending if it's a hard bristle brush or if it's real cheap, you can end up, uh, you know, putting some scratches in it. A lot of people will ask, when you oil a fretboard, what should you use? Some people will ask, can you use olive oil? Can you use, you know, um, three-in-one oil? Um, what you want to use is any type of oil that you would ordinarily use for woodworking. Okay, and in this case, I'm going to be using Howard Feed and Wax. This is my favorite uh, fretboard uh, oil. It's got beeswax in it, as well as uh, certain oils, and it cleans as well as it uh, re. Um, hydrates in a way, even though it's not hydrating, because that's water. Um, but what it does is it ends up uh, putting the oils back in that had been lost over time. Don't get fancy with different types of oils. Just use, you know, use anything that you would ordinarily use on wood, but don't use things like olive oil and stuff like that, okay? Some people will say, can you clean a fretboard with water and a toothbrush? You can, and you can probably get away with it, but I don't recommend doing it, okay? Um, it's usually better to use things that are not going to absorb inside the fretboard that can cause it to uh, expand uh, from absorption or uh, end up causing a fret to pop out or, or something along those lines. A lot of times you can get away with it, nothing will happen, but generally I think it's a bad idea. I'll usually use some type of product like naphtha or something along those lines to clean everything. After this is set for a moment, okay, I go through with the rag again and I try to clean up all of the oil that I had applied. Now what this does is it rehydrates, and I keep using the word hydrate when I really shouldn't because hydrate basically means water. But what it, what, what it does is it puts the oils back that had been lost over time because the oils within wood will dissipate over a given period of time. Now if you have something like maple or something, usually those have been um, coated with some type of lacquer. And if that's the case, you don't really have to worry about putting any oil or anything on. Um, if it is a unfinished maple fretboard, um, you can use something like butcher block oil, um, but you don't want to put a lot. And you know, oil can be just as bad as water if you put too much. People have a tendency to over oil their fretboards too often. The only time that you need to do this is when you do a thorough cleaning, um, which is maybe once a year, maybe once every two years. Okay, So now that I've got all of this uh, cleaned up, um, you know, and I'm double checking the rag, I'm see when I get right next to these frets, I'm seeing if I see any like dirt or anything show up, because if, if I do, that means I need to continue cleaning. But we're pretty good. What I'm feeling in these areas is actually uh, super glue or, or something that they use to embed uh, to attach the uh, frets to the fretboard. So that is that. And that's all you have to do to clean a fretboard. People, a lot of people, they, um, they overthink it. They try to get too creative uh, when cleaning a fretboard and you don't need to do that.
I also will generally come in here and also kind of clean all the dust and everything off of the pickups and everything up in this area too while I have everything off. Okay. Now, before I reattach the strings uh, on this, I have to check the pickup. Now, he was saying that the pickup kind of goes in and out and sometimes the pot makes funny noises. So, we're going to go ahead and take a look at this. We're going to take off the cavity cover on the rear here so we can see if there's anything that jumps out at us um, that doesn't look right. Okay, Visual inspection is important. Now this particular screw that I'm taking out right here, it was loose. Okay, I'm going to show you how you can go ahead and make that tight again. This will, and it will also work on necks and neck pockets. Okay. So what I'm doing right here is I'm looking for anything that is visually wrong, okay? Now, what, what could be visually wrong? Um, a wire touching another wire, for instance, or um, like this black wire right here being kind of long and maybe touching another portion of that switch, you know? I'm looking for anything that could be a problem. I'm looking at uh, these wires right here, seeing if they're touching something that they're not supposed to be touching. I'm looking for loose connections. I'm looking for anything that just doesn't seem quite right. And I'm also going to be looking at the pickup a little bit later, and I'm also going to be looking at the input jack, or the output jack for that matter, to see if there's something there that might be causing this. Now let's say, for instance, Let's say I don't see anything. Well, there could be a problem with um, just debris and dust and things like that getting within the potentiometer. So what you can get is uh, some simple cleaner and lubricant. This is for um, electronic contact cleaner. Okay, And I'm going to come inside here where the pot is, where that opening is right there, and I'm going to spray this, and I'm going to turn this handle on the pot a few times going both ways. That should take care of that. And I'm also going to be doing the exact same thing up here. You can sometimes also spray in like little sections like that depending on who makes the potentiometer. Now that I've done that, I'm going to do the same thing to the switch. Okay. And then from here, I'm going to move this back and forth. Now this cleans it and it lubricates it. Okay. Now from here, once again, I'm double checking everything. I want to make sure that there's no wires that are broken. I want to make sure that there's no wires that have accidentally been snipped from when somebody was trying to strip the insulation because that happens sometimes. You'll see right here in areas like this a lot of times you'll see it, it's cut and you'll have intermittent um, uh, sound coming in and out. So you want to check things like that. You want to look for breaks. You want to look for bad solder joints. You want to look for anything. Everything that I saw in here seems fine. So now what we're going to do is since that looks okay, we're going to get into the pickup here. We're going to pop this off and we're going to look at the pickup to see if there is any wires or breaks or anything along, any types of shorting out. Because generally, that's going to be the problem with the pickup. Something is shorting out. So, we'll take these. Also, this is also a good time to look at the pickup rings to see if somebody had installed them upside down, like backwards. In other words, it would be like this instead of like this. Okay, kind of pull this a little bit. Right in this area right here, you'll see some wires that have been uh, put together inside there. Maybe not so well, but there's a couple that have been tied together. And if it's not there, it's going to be over here. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to loosen these screws a little bit. Okay. And I need to get this tape off. 
And the only way that I'm going to be able to do that is to take these screws out completely. So now that I've got now that I've got this loosened, I want to I want to look around this, and I want to find where the tape ends, which is right here, and very carefully I want to remove this tape. And the reason why you want to remove it very carefully is because this is a directly attached to the coil. Okay. Now this has been wax potted. Okay. Now see this right here has me concerned how this is kind of loose right there and I can see wires that could be the potential uh, a potential problem so I want to gently remove this if it if it is coming off if it, if it, if it doesn't really want to come off um, unless like you you do a lot of pulling um, what you can do is take a hair dryer to it and it'll loosen up any um, tape residue or wax that might be potentially holding this stuff together okay okay so now that we've got the tape off where you're going to find the problem is going to be in areas like this where they they tie this coil to this coil and sometimes they'll put glue and things inside there to kind of keep it in place um, but I need to I need to get access to that so that way I can verify that there's no breaks or it's a bad connection Anytime that you're working on a pickup, you have to be very careful that you do not damage any of the coils inside. A lot of times when they end up putting, when they end up uh, taping these off, sometimes the tape comes undone and or it doesn't get taped well and then it touches the body, it touches the pickup uh, uh, plate and when that ends up happening is it grounds out so you might lose one of the coils or you might lose both coils and then if it's something that's um, ever so slightly there you'll have an intermittent pickup as well or, or you're gonna get you're gonna you can get static you get all sorts of nasty things so what I want to do is I want to take a look at these and I want to make sure that these have been taped off well and nothing is touching one another Okay, what you're, this white stuff you see is the wax. There's no reason to wax pot this again um, after you do this. So these look, these look to be taped okay, um, but I have to make sure that they've been soldered together well and they're not, they're not uh, breaking apart. And um, the only way to do that is to remove the tape that's on here and verify just like that okay I can tell that that's soldered well okay and while I am doing this I'm also noticing that the pickup has its uh, position pieces the the adjustable pieces down here generally these are toward the neck and this is toward the bridge okay so I might flip this because that will help a little bit um, when it comes to really trying to dial in the sound. And it's not as important when you're just going uh, humbucker, humbucker, but if you have a coil tap, I shouldn't say coil tap, but if you have a coil split, um, it can make a difference. So it's usually a good idea to keep this that way and then this this way. But another way to make sure that he didn't flip the magnets or something in there. I don't want to assume anything. I'm going to put my compass here. So this is the north side because it's pointing south. And I'm going to come over here and I am getting the south side. So I, he has not changed the, the, the pickups at all. Um, uh, the magnet. So I could leave it like this, flip the magnet, and then it would be okay. Or I, I can get this and flip the pickup. Depending on how much wire he left in there, I might not be able to. So I'll, I'll see about that here in a minute. But now that I've, I've got those off and I can tell everything has been soldered well, I know that the problem isn't there. There is the potential uh, of the problem being where this lead wire is going back into the coil. But if I were to start digging into that, 
I might damage the coil. So it's better to assume that that is not the problem and figure it was just a sticky potentiometer. It was just a bad, uh, dirty pot. Okay, And you want to make sure that these get taped very well so they cannot touch each other. Okay, Just like that. Now at different luthier supply companies you can get pickup tape, okay? Tape that is uh, made for pickups. And it's basically electrical tape, but it comes in different uh, widths, as well as usually the one that goes around the outside is like a fabric that has been impregnated. And I want to, when I put this back, I don't want it to really look like I ever took it apart. Now, if we saw that one of these wires was loose or something like that, we would resolder it, okay? Um, but I didn't see anything like that. Everything looks okay. Ordinarily, I wouldn't take a pickup like this apart because it's, it's a rare occurrence, but I told him I would take it apart just to verify to make sure that uh, everything within the pickup itself is kosher. So now that I have that, this is the pickup tape that I'm going to be putting around the outside of it. And you can tell that it's kind of it's fabric. So I'm going to take these and once again just kind of push them over to one side like this. I'm going to start here, grab and pull to kind of make these flat again and wrap this around the outside. So now that that has been put back together I can go ahead and reattach the pickup ring and keep in mind that the pickup rings when you see them like this high side goes to bridge, low side starts going to neck and that's, all we, and that's even the case here on the neck. Okay? I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody that had installed them the other way and it can modify the way that the pickup um, sounds. Not dramatically, but it puts the pickup at a strange angle to the strings. Now as soon as I get this started and lift it up a little bit, I'm going to be putting the screws back in. Now there's one more thing to uh, consider when doing this and that is looking at the wires that you cannot see the ones that go through the cavities every now and then um, you'll see that somebody would have extended the wire and put an electrical tape on it and all this other stuff and the electrical, uh, electrical tape comes loose and the next thing you know you have things grounding out so once again visual inspection now so far this is pretty straightforward this, th this guitar um, I'm going a little bit above and beyond what I would ordinarily do but um, for the sake of trying to show you how a lot of this stuff should be done that's why I'm doing it. Might as well clean this while I have the opportunity and I'm only going to bring this up a little bit because we're going to adjust these pickups uh, in just a little while after we put the strings back on. Um, this I'm going to get and I'm going to flip it if I can. It depends on how much wire is left. Sometimes people cut the wire way too short so it doesn't give you any room for adjustments. Okay, so it does give me room to do that, but I have to flip the pickup ring as well. And also looking at these uh, pickups, it doesn't look like anybody has ever adjusted the pull pieces. And adjusting the pull pieces can make a dramatic difference in the way your guitar sounds. So we're going to be doing that too, and I'll show you how to do that, where everything sounds like it's supposed to. So now that I've got that in, once again, the, the taller part toward the bridge. So we're getting real close to being able to put some strings on, but before I can put some strings on, I'm going to double check that the frets are okay. Now usually I will put this in a neck jig in order to do that, 
But I'm going to show you, you don't have to have a neck jig to, um, do, you know, check to see if your, your frets are perfectly level. Just make sure that you have access to the truss rod and you will need a very uh, accurate straight edge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my uh, very accurate straight edge here and I'm going to lay it right down the center of these frets. And I can, uh, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the top of every fret and I'm trying to see if I see light uh, between the straight edge and the top of the fret. If I see light, that means that fret is low. Okay, um, I'm also seeing if I can get this thing to rock. Now, this, without any truss rod adjustments, is very straight, okay? It's very straight. But, there's one thing that I notice, and these two right here are not touching the straight edge. So this has a very slight back bow right here. Now, because of its location, um, if it was any worse, um, deep after I end up putting the strings on and there's tension on it, it might bring that forward and make everything perfectly flat. Um, but if it was any worse, um, it could create a problem with um, open, open strings uh, having fret buzz. And because what ends up happening is that string comes down this way and it kind of shoots down, right? And so, if the nut height is not perfectly correct, um, what happens is uh, when you hit that open string, it hits these two guys, okay, gets some buzz, and as soon as you fret here, you're bypassing that back bow. And as soon as you do that, then all of a sudden the fret buzz goes away. But um, it's ever so slight. It's not even the thickness of a business card. And I think when I put tension on here from the strings, it'll take that, that bow out. And he never complained about fret buzz. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming uh, that everything is okay with that. But I did want to check these. Now, if they were severely out, okay, what is severely out? Um, if maybe this section, you could put a business card this section is touching, this section may be a business card, this section may be a business card. In other words, we have a roller coaster, we'd have to level the frets, okay? Because if not, we wouldn't be able to get really low action. And that's what he wants is really low action. Um, if, if we were getting a rock, what we would do is we would adjust the truss rod until we can make this as flat as we possibly could. But the way that the truss rod is currently adjusted, that thing set nearly perfectly flat. There were a couple of spots that it probably wouldn't hurt to do fine tuning on the frets, um, but when I start doing fret work, it, it goes into the realm of more work that's outside of the uh, realm of just a uh, setup. So if you do want to know how to do fret work and how to uh, make everything perfectly level, um, in my guitar building course, I go over that on building necks and fretwork. And it has everything that you would need to know um, as far as making sure that everything on your neck is absolutely perfect before you start putting your strings and everything back on. But this is in good condition, and so there's, no, there's nothing that I really need to do on this. If I wanted to, um, just to kind of make things look a little bit nicer, I could take this to the buffer and um, just buff everything up real nice and then clean it again and it will look fantastic. In fact, I'm probably going to do that because some of these frets look a little dull. It only takes me a minute to do it, but to the customer, they're like, wow, look at what he did to my neck. It looks fantastic. So it's the little things that make a difference. Now, before I start getting ready to put strings and stuff back on, I want to clean this a little bit. and. Um, I am going to take the fretboard to the buffer, but the reason why I want this all the dust and everything off and I want everything to look nice and clean is because it means a lot to the customer. When the guitar shows up and, and it looks nicer and cleaner than it did when it uh, left uh, you know, their possession, um, it means a lot. It's just like if you go and you have tires put on your car and the people there clean your rims too. 
they don't put just the tires they clean your rims you you're you're like wow that's really nice that's cool you, you know and that's pretty much the same thing I, when it comes back I want them to look at it and go wow there was a lot of work done on this and it's usually only a minute or two of work so right now I'm gonna go ahead and buff this out on the buffer and then I'm gonna clean it again because it will leave a residue from the buffing and then we can start putting the strings back on and from there We'll see if we have to do a truss rod adjustment. We'll see if we have to set the intonation any. We'll see if we have to adjust the action. And after everything is said and done, we will also check the electronics to make sure that we're not getting any strange noises. If we are getting strange noises from the potentiometer still, then we're gonna to have to replace it. So now that this has been buffed and it looks nice and shiny, I have to get that residue off. If not, it's gonna end up leaving a um, it's going to end up making the person's fingers black when they try playing. So right now I'm using naphtha. Buffing will also end up um, removing a lot of that debris, uh, that oil and dead skin cells and stuff. The buffing will also get rid of that. So um, if you're having a hard time cleaning the fretboard, you can always take it to the buffer and you want to keep cleaning this until you no longer see any black show up on your rag okay so that's been cleaned up and now we can go ahead and start uh, talking about uh, putting the strings back on and there's one thing that you notice I didn't do before I started working on this guitar and that was I did not check every single fret to see if there was any buzz okay and um, the main reason why I did not do that is because that was never a problem with this customer okay because he said that every there, he has no fret buzz everything's great there, there, so there was really no reason for me to do that um, after I'm done putting the strings on I am going to go through and I'm going to check to see and make sure that there is no fret buzz okay um, but I generally will do that with a new set of strings. Um, I'll generally do that um, before I send any guitar out. Now, if somebody had said, hey, I have a lot of fret buzz, that would be the very first thing I would have checked, right? I would go up and play every string, every note, up and down the fretboard, making sure uh, that I knew exactly where the fret buzz was. And um, once again, when it comes to things like uh, fret work and fret buzz, uh, in my guitar building course, which you can order at the Gelden Guitars website, I go over all of that stuff. Okay, so um, instead of you know doing it twice, uh, once in this video and once in that video, um, it's better that you just uh, get the guitar building course if you do not have that, because it will tell you everything you need to do uh, as far as repairing frets, uh, putting new frets in, doing fret jobs, and all that stuff. Um, on the uh, when we put the strings on I will be checking every single note and every string okay so that way I know exactly how uh, high I can adjust the action how low I can get it and one of the very first things I should probably mention is when it comes to setups um, the very first thing you should do is get the whole concept of numbers out of your head. There's a lot of people that will uh, ask, hey, at the 14th fret, what should the height be between you know, the 14th fret and the bottom of the string on the E, right? Or what should the height of the pickups be, and things like that. Get that out of your head, okay? Um, though there is no set number, um, there are numbers that uh, some websites will give you, some manufacturers will give you, but those numbers are starting points. It's very much like a recipe if you were cooking, and it might say use a quarter of a teaspoon of salt and a quarter of a teaspoon of pepper, and after you cook it, you might sit there and say it doesn't have enough salt, or it doesn't have enough pepper, or it has too much pepper, and that is the exact same thing when you're doing a setup on a guitar. It might give you a starting point, but the reality is um, you should never go by that, okay? Every guitar is different, every player is different, and you need to set it up for the player, 
right? Somebody might want higher action. And if you set it up to what the manufacturer says, it might be too low, okay? Uh, some people like very low action, okay? And if you go by what the manufacturer says, it might be too high. If you change the gauge of your strings, that's going to change the height of your action and stuff like that as well. So don't just get the numbers out of your head. Go by feel, and that's the important thing. Go by feel, go by intonation and everything like that. Go by what you can get away with with a particular guitar, and go by the sound of it. So when we get ready to do the pickups, that's exactly what we're going to do. Is We're going to go by the sound. We're not going to be looking at any types of height or anything like that because depending on the strength of the, the magnet inside the pickup that can change things that you can't go by the height some people say it should be about an eighth of an inch three sixteenths you cannot do that if you want your guitar to sound um, the best it can be okay so get all of that stuff out of your head now this particular guitar has a tunematic bridge the type that you'd find on a Gibson and some people, when placing the tunematic on, there's an argument. And the argument is, what side should the screws be on? Now, it's easier to make the adjustments if the screws are on the back side, okay? But sometimes, depending, you have to put it this way, okay? And it just depends on what kind of back angle we have these strings going. Now, let me, let me move this. When, if you have a tailpiece here, let, let's say it's a Gibson, you have a tailpiece here, you have to have a back angle that puts tension on the saddle, okay? If it was flat like this, that would be bad. If it was really extreme like that, that would be bad. You want it to be about right here. It's close, like where they've drilled those holes, it's close, okay? Now, this particular bridge, um, when I get this and I set this here, the first two things that I notice is that this and this are all the way to the front, okay? They're all the way to the front, and one of them is turned, so this cannot move forward anymore, and this one has not been turned. Um, so I might be able to get another sixteenth of an inch out of this when it's time to set the intonation. Now, <clears throat> does that is this going to be a problem? I don't know yet. When I put the strings back on and set the intonation, I will know. You'll, if you also, if you look at these, uh, these, uh, these types of bridges, let me get closer so you can see what's going on. There's usually a spring right here that holds these screws kind of taut, right? Now, what can happen is these, it, it can be loose, and when it's loose, it can cause these to vibrate. And uh, let me move it up. It can cause the screws to vibrate and it'll make it sound like there's some type of fret buzz going on when there is not fret buzz. It's this vibrating. So if that is the case, what you can do is grab a flathead screwdriver and grab a flathead screwdriver and right where that spring is, get it and push down, okay? And try to bend it. I'm gonna set it, I'm gonna set this where you can see me do this, okay? So basically right here where that spring is, I'm getting this the screwdriver and I'm pushing down on it. Now, what that has done is it's put a V right here and it's made sure that now that there's contact between all of them except for, well that one, I might have to push it again like right here, okay? But what that does is it makes sure that the, these are all in contact and you won't get that, that fret buzz sound because that is a common thing, okay? Now, I'm gonna see if, uh, since he's already got this adjusted in this direction, I'm gonna see if the intonation is fine. Also, another thing to keep, uh, to look at, is sometimes these bridges will bend right here, if they're, if they're cheaply made. And if they're cheaply made, it mess it, and it gets bent, it messes with the action height on the middle strings. So take a look at it. Make sure that this is straight or it's got a slight curve up and it follows the, um, the actual radius of the fretboard. Sometimes people will take these apart and not knowing that some of these saddles are at different heights, right? And they don't put the small one uh, where on the outside edges and they don't put the, the taller ones 
in the middle. So they'll put the taller one out here and they'll, they'll mix and match them, not realizing it, and it screws up all, it screws the action up over the whole thing. So make sure that when you're looking at this, it's got the proper radius as well. So now at this point, I'm gonna start stringing up the guitar. And after I string it up, I'll turn the camera back on and we're gonna, uh, and I'm gonna bring it to pitch. From there, we're gonna do a truss rod adjustment. And after we do the truss rod adjustment, we'll start looking at the intonation. When you first put your strings on, you wanna go ahead and grab them and stretch them like this. Um, and it will help uh, help you out a lot when you're, you're, you're trying to get this thing in tune. You want to take that extra stretch out like this now instead of constantly retuning the thing until all the stretch finally ends up leaving. So now that I've got this um, set up uh, to uh, it being in pitch, um, I'm going to put my straight edge once again on this and I'm wanting to see how much relief um, this neck has. Now this neck has a lot of relief in it right now. Um, and the relief is a bend. It's like a banana. It's a forward bow in the neck. And uh, some people like to have a lot of relief and other people not so much. Now this particular guitar, it has a little bit more relief than I think it should have. So I'm going to take my truss rod wrench and I'm going to tighten this a little bit. Now the amount of relief that you want on this is not perfectly flat. What you would want is maybe a couple of business cards for the thickness. Something else I should cover a little bit and that's uh, playing position. There's some people that when they are setting the truss rod, when they're setting the action, they do everything from the playing position. And um, it does make it more accurate, but, and this is the big but here, um, it doesn't really make that big of a difference. Now, if you have a very, very thin neck, it's probably a good idea that you do it in the playing position, okay? If you have a two-way truss rod and a thick neck or, or anything along those lines, um, you can do it just like I'm doing it here. Um, only every now and then do I have to actually do stuff in the playing position. Um, the amount of drop or the amount that this sags due to gravity is insignificant, okay? Unless, once again, uh, you have a very thin neck um, or the truss rod isn't, doesn't have any tension on it at all or maybe the headstock is very heavy, uh, something along those lines. It doesn't hurt to do it in the playing position, uh, but for me, it's a lot quicker to do it this way, and then I fine-tune it in the playing position, right? Um, get the majority of everything done like this, and then do any fine-tuning that you need to do in the playing position, and it's, it's just a lot easier. Um, also, um, I'm doing it this way, so you can see exactly what I'm doing. Um, if I was doing it in the playing position, it would be facing this way, and there's nowhere I could put my camera right there. So now that I have this, now that I have all these strings set up and they're in tune and I have my truss, my truss rod adjustment done and um, the next step is to make sure that the nut height is correct before I start doing anything with the intonation. If I start messing with the intonation and the nut height isn't right, eh, it's going to have problems. Always start with the nut and then do your bridge. Okay, so I have this set so you can see what I'm doing here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to push down on the third fret on the, the high E and what I want to see is an ever so slight gap between the uh, fret and the string. Okay. Now when I'm doing this, it's hitting the string. That's no good. Okay. I want to be able to put uh, maybe a business card between that. Business card is my number, okay? And that is touching. That can create fret buzz on an open string if it's too low, okay? I'm gonna do the same thing with the B string. That's touching. The G string is touching. Geez, the um, D is touching. The A is touching. And so is the E. 
okay? But we're not getting any fret buzz. Now, ordinarily, I would shim up that nut just a touch um, because you should have a little bit there. Now, <clears throat> since I'm not getting any fret buzz on that first fret, I'm going to call it good, but it's dangerously low. And typically, you want to be able to see a gap about the size of a business card um, on all of them uh, when you clamp down on the first fret. If you see more than that, then you need to get a nut file and file down the slots a little bit and lower those strings. Now, why is it important that you lower the strings um, and you have the nut uh, set to the correct, uh, the, nut, the nut slots set to the correct height? Because if this, is, if this is high up, if this string is high up right here, and I end up pushing down right here, it puts a lot of tension on the string right here. And if it puts a lot of tension, it increases the pitch. So what will happen is if I'm doing like an open D chord, um, what, what, you, what you'll hear is a couple of these strings are going to be out of tune. They're going to be sharp. And as soon as I start playing in the upper register, it sounds normal. The intonation will be just fine everywhere except for when you're doing open chords. So it's really important that this is set correctly. Um, generally when you buy a guitar, these are always really high. They're higher than they should be. And so when you start doing your A's and your D chords, um, you'll hear those sharp notes come out. That sharpness is coming from an improper uh, nut slot height. Now this particular one is just fine. Uh, it's like I said, it's dangerously low. Um, but since we're not, since we're not getting any fret buzz, um, I'm going to leave it alone. Um, now, if we were getting fret buzz, either the nut has to be replaced or we have to shim the nut. There is one thing about this that concerns me, and that is, is when it's time for me to set the action height. If I try to lower it, we will get fret buzz. Okay if I try to set the action a little bit lower than this. Um, if I raise it, we'll, we'll be okay. But um, I'm not sure um, if I'm going to be getting fret buzz if I end up trying to lower the action any. Now looking at the action, it looks pretty low already. Um, but I always try to get it as low as I can. Since the action height looks pretty good right now, uh, the next step for me is actually going to be the intonation on this. If, it, um, if the action height did not look good, I would lower the action to the point that I wanted it at, and then from there, I would start setting the intonation. But then, once again, like I said, you lower the action, you might start getting fret buzz right here if the nut slots are incorrect. This brings up the question of what is the proper action height? And, um, and I said, ignore the numbers, ignore the numbers. And I'm going to show you right now how you figure out what the perfect action height is for your guitar and for the strings that you're using. Now the way that you determine that, um, the action height, is what you want to do is you want to start playing every note up the fretboard. And you're listening for any fret buzz. And I didn't hear any. Okay, and you do that on every string. You also want to listen for any notes that are fretting out. Um, uh, so for instance, like if I'm hitting here, and um, I, if I hit here and it, and it sounds the same, you know, that means that up here, one of the frets is, is high. And usually what that means is you either have to raise your action or you have to level your frets. Okay. But basically, okay, so I'm not really hearing a lot of fret buzz or anything on this. So what I would try to do is I would try to lower the bridge a little bit. Um, and then I would do the exact same test again. And I would keep doing it until I got fret buzz. And then after I get fret buzz, I back the bridge up again, just a hair, in, in order to get rid of what fret buzz I created by lowering the action. And the action height on this right now is pretty low, um, but I think I can get a little bit lower. And I'm going to do this in the playing position. 
and I'm going to just lower the bridge just a little bit at a time um, until I start hearing fret buzz. As soon as I hear fret buzz, then I'm going to lift the, the bridge back up again. Now, when I was lowering the action on this, you hear that? That's the first fret. That's because of the nut. Okay, and because of that, um, I can probably lower the action a little bit more, but the nut either has to be replaced or I have to shim it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to contact the owner of the guitar and ask him uh, what, what route he wants me to go. Um, because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's his money and it's his decision. Um, and um, I can still continue doing the rest of the setup without the nut really being perfect right now. I can still set the intonation pretty close, but um, it needs the nut needs is an issue that needs to be addressed. So um, at this point, I contact the owner, and depending on what they say, um, that's how I go about doing it. So I spoke to the um, owner, and the owner said, let's replace the nut. So I'm going to replace it with buffalo, a buffalo horn. Um, now, before I do that, um, because it's close enough, I can set the intonation. And um, when setting the intonation on any guitar, okay, that's adjustable, of course. Acoustics, not so much. Um, if you understand the basic principle behind it, um, you can set intonation on any electric guitar, and it's, it's real simple. Okay, We have a scale length. And this is 25 and a half inches. Dead center is 12 inches on the 12th fret. Okay, And when we hit this in this tune, in, in tune, okay, um, and we have this perfectly in tune, what we want to do is we want to hold down the 12th fret and then hit it again and we should get exactly one octave up okay, on the 12th fret of these. You can also do it on the 24th. Okay. Now, intonation is the adjustment of making sure that the scale length is correct, but it also takes into account for the pressure that you put down on the string, which stretches the string. Okay. And <clears throat> it's important that when you're setting the intonation, that you set it the way the person plays it. Okay, so if they have a very heavy hand and they really have a death grip when they're fretting notes, um, you need to intonate it by squeezing hard. If they have a very light touch, you need to intonate it with a very light touch. Okay, it's I can I usually get it right on the money, very close, but depending on who's playing it, I tell them you might have to do an ever so slight adjustment depending on your playing style. Okay, um, but generally, it's it's good to go. One thing that you need to kind of keep an eye out for is if you have very tall frets. Okay, there's a chance um, more often than not that the um, intonation will go a little sharp when you push down on it. If you have scalloped fretboard, the same thing. Okay, it has a tendency to go a little sharp. So make make sure that you're pushing down correctly on the frets when you're doing your intonation okay so let's you can use just any tuner to do it um, now what I usually do is use a tuner like this and then afterwards um, before I ship it out I end up um, taking it to my strobe tuner in my office and I end up uh, fine-tuning it with the strobe tuner okay so let's do an example here now, I'm hoping the camera picks this up. So I'm going to hit the open E, and you'll see that it's gone sharp. So I need to get this um, down a little bit. This, since this is new, uh, I can get some stretch out of the string like this without even adjusting the tuner, and I'll end up getting uh, this closer. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of a stretch. There's still a considerable amount of stretch in these strings. Now when you first hit a string, it's always going to go a little sharp.
and then it balances out like right there okay so that's pretty close so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fret to 12th and I'm going to hit it again and you'll see that this time the needle is on this side it's flat just a little bit it's off a couple of cents now if it's flat okay that means that the saddle needs to go toward the 12th fret if it's sharp it needs to go away from the 12th fret so that's saying that this saddle right here needs to come closer this way okay now we have a slight problem this saddle can't move that far forward anymore okay um, it's pretty much at its it's almost at its max but what I'm going to do is I'm going to see how far I can get it forward hopefully that's enough because if it's not, what I'm going to have to do is take this saddle out and flip it around so the flat side is out here. And that will give me a little bit of extra um, play. There we go. Okay, so the E has been set, and I'm going to do this to each string. Now, it's important to notice that if when you, when you have the string in tune open, Okay, if it's ever so slightly off, that little bit that is off gets amplified when you do the twelfth fret. So if you see it only a half cent off um, when it's open, when you fret it, it might be two or three cents off when you fret. Okay, so it's important to get it as close as you can to dead on. Okay, this needs to come forward more. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, and let me see if I can do it, this is a light touch right here. That's me pushing hard. So do you see that it's important that you know what the person's um, touch is like uh, before you start trying to set the intonation? Because if they push really, really hard, um, you're not going to set it right. Let me loosen the string because it'll make the saddle move a lot easier. Now I don't know if I can get that much out of this. I might have to flip this one as well. Okay, so right here, you'll see I'm I'm about a cent a cent off or so, which basically means this does have to be flipped. Now before I flip this, I'm going to check the other the other strings as well to see if I have to flip any of those because I want to do it all at the same time the D and the A have to be flipped around okay so I'm gonna loosen the strings so now that I've got these strings loosened I'm gonna go ahead and remove these um, these screws and I have to kind of get that spring out of the way a little bit there and I'm going to just keep turning this until it comes out and then I'm going to flip that saddle around so I, I went ahead and I've loosened this and I've got this where I can get this take it out flip it around and put it in this way so I have this all the way forward now on the D I put that back and I have to do the exact same thing to the A okay so the A is okay now and also keep in mind that if you are changing the gauge of strings you will also have to set the intonation again sometimes not so much and then other times you have to set it a lot the D is very close but it's not it's not exact and I've got this thrown all the way forward and flipped that's really the best I'm going to be able to do uh, with that um, because of the way that this is built where we can't really change the position of the bridge now if you look at this you'll see that all of these are really thrown far forward which means the manufacturer really should have brought this forward about an eighth of an inch when they ended up making this 
um, it's a design flaw, you know, um, it is what it is, but you just try to get it as close as you can possibly get it. Um, sometimes y you can change the intonation by raising the bridge or lowering the bridge, but see, we already have low action, so we can't really lower it anymore. Now, what you can do if you have like a bolt on neck, this is a set neck, but if you have a bolt on neck, you can sometimes mess around with the intonation a little bit by putting a shim on the very front of it. Uh, underneath that will cause it to have a slight back angle this way that will end up increasing the string length um, if you need to um, that's if you need to expand it sometimes you can even put a shim on the very front of the neck so it doesn't set so far into the pocket that will also expand it this is actually something that we need to shrink okay and there's really no way for us to be able to do that because this is a set neck there's very little we can do and this is so close this is so close to being in perfect intonation that we can call it good you know um, they do make um, things uh, you can buy at stewmac.com and what it is is there there are pieces that you can slide you take this bridge off you slide it over um, the pole pieces and then you put this on that new the new piece and it's offset a little bit and it, and it gives you an opportunity to kind of move these things around a little bit give yourself a little bit of extra room you can purchase those things um, they look awkward but it does fix the, the 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 problem of the intonation now the intonation on this now is good enough for me to say that it's it's done and it's fine but um, like I said, before I ship these out, I always take it to the strobe tuner in my office and, and verify. So now we're going to set the height of the pickups. Okay? And it doesn't require a full-on amp to do this. You can use a little amp like this. And what I'm going to do, a little battery-powered amp, is plug this guy in. Turn it on. To a clean channel. And you'll hear that with this distance right here, this still sounds good. It's a little thin, um, but it's, it sounds pretty good. Now, when you're adjusting the height of these, some people say it should be an eighth of an inch or maybe uh, three sixteenths or something along those lines. And you can't go by that. You have to go by the way the guitar sounds. And when I'm doing this, I'm not hearing a lot of the bass. So I'm, lo I'm raising the bass side. Every note should have the same um, loudness to it, okay? We should be able to hear those equally. And now I'm going to test all the other strings. It seems that the E is the only one that's a little, a little low. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this pull piece to get that. By raising this pull piece up, it does an it does an individual um, loudness for that, and the D and the A sound like they could be raised a little bit as well. Probably wouldn't hurt to have this side come up just a little bit more.
maybe lower this side just a touch. There we go. That sounds good. And you'll see that now every note is the same loudness, but this pickup is actually at a very slight, a slight slant and also I've got these pole pieces raised. If we were to go by the manufacturer's recommendations, it wouldn't be like that. That's why I'm saying you cannot go by the numbers, you have to go by the sound of it. So now what we have to do is we have to make sure that the loudness of this is the same as the loudness of this and we're going to be doing it the exact same way. So we go that's too quiet. So what we do is we raise this up. Um, when you get your pickup too close to the strings, it can sound a little funny because of the shape of the magnetic field around the pickup. Um, we have a field that's running from the tops of these poles around like this. Okay, and we want it to be caught in that magnetic field uh, where it's the largest. If we end up bringing this too close, we're really only getting a little bit of that magnetic field right here, and then right here is where you're going to be getting the rest, and it can sound wobbly, like it'll sound a little strange if it's too close. If it's too far away, um, it will sound clean, but it'll sound a little thin. Okay, and also if you get it too close, you can also have it where it sounds a little distorted. So you're trying to find that happy medium. That's too loud now. And the neck pickup is more sensitive than the bridge pickup because of where it's located. There's more vibration here than there is here. Okay, so this will have a tendency to be louder than this. I could probably lower it just a little bit more. That's pretty good. So now what I'm going to do is the exact same thing that I did with this with the pull pieces. The low end needs to come up just a little bit. That's good. That needs to be lowered. I can get the screwdriver in there. It needs to be lowered. actually needs to be raised.
okay. So now that these have been these have been set now where it's not going to be distorted. It's set where you get a clean sound. It's set where you get a good amount of um, of. Uh, it's set where you get a good amount of volume. It's set where every string is really close to the exact same loudness, and we're good. So these pickups have been set. Now I'm moving this back and forth, and I'm listening for any types of crackling or clicks or anything like that, and I'm going to do the same with the volume knob. So it seems that the contact cleaner worked. And what we're going to do is we're going to get this and we're going to flip it over. There's one more thing that I need to check that I haven't done yet. And that is the output jack. Okay. Because there is the possibility that we have one stray wire from the ground that might be hitting the positive and causing it to every now and then uh, short out and if it does that you lose all of your sound okay so just to be safe we're gonna go ahead and pop this up pop this out and look make sure that the wires are not broken nothing frayed touching something else and we're okay now looking at this remember how I said that one screw didn't really, it was loose and it didn't really uh, feel like there was anything attached to it. Now I'm going to show you how you can fix that, but this particular one is going to require a little bit more um, work in order for that to happen. Now if I remove this this shim right here, there is wood that has been removed. Okay, it's gone is because this was drilled too close and it popped off okay so that requires a little bit more work but let's say for instance it's not like that let's say it's just a hole here that's a little bit too big what you do is you just get a toothpick and you dip it in wood glue you stuff it inside there and take a razor or a, a very sharp knife and you just cut it flush to that and you let the glue dry and then you have um, you'll have what you uh, wood that you can grab to you can do the exact same thing with a neck that um, a bolt-on neck that has um, the, it's a little loose right from where the screw goes in it's a little loose stuff about five or six toothpicks inside there with some wood glue let it dry cut it off flush you might have to drill a pilot hole again but then um, stick that in there and it will it'll go ahead and uh, fix that so it'll grab again if it doesn't work, if that's still not enough, then you don't have a choice but to drill out the hole and then glue a dowel inside of it and then redrill uh, re a pilot hole if it doesn't work on a neck. Um, but this right here, I'm gonna, I'll show you a trick to this. What we can do is we can get a piece of tape. So I take a piece of tape and then I run it on the inside of this. Okay, Pretty much just like that. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to be mixing some epoxy and pouring it inside that hole and letting it set up. And after I do that, I'm going to try to redrill a hole inside there and see if I can get it to grab. If that doesn't work, the next step, um, and this is a lot of work for one little screw, but the next step would be to take a chisel and cut this out square and then glue a small block inside there and um, after that dries redrill the hole and it'll work but I'm, I'm going to try to get it to work with epoxy um, sometimes you can even use super glue um, for it uh, to grab now what, what I'm going to do is for the sake of ease here we're going to see if we can get super glue to work so I've got super glue gel here It usually takes a few seconds for this to harden up when you put the accelerant on it.
Now, I try not to get too much accelerant on the finish because it can actually damage the finish depending on uh, the type of finish that it is. Okay, But um, it does dry really fast and now that that hole is filled up we're going to see if after I drill a small pilot hole if it um, fixes that. I'm using a very very small bit and inside here there's going to be a little bit of uh, super glue that has not completely dried yet so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this with accelerant like that and then um, try to get this in as fast as I can and the super glue will set up and form in the shape of the screw like that so now it's 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 in there and it's holding Okay, so that worked is it the greatest fix? No, it's not ideal, but you know we're dealing with a piece of wood that's missing. Um, it is what it is. So at this point, um, except for the nut that I have to replace, this is finished. And one of the very last things that I'll usually do is I will put on um, a wax on the outside of this, a car wax, let it dry and then kind of buff it out by hand with a uh, lint-free cloth to take any fingerprints or anything off of it make it look everything look real nice um, and I do that on the front and the back and I just want this to look real nice so when I end up sending it back to the guy um, it, it looks good and also another thing that you can do is with black hardware you can always take a sharpie and go over the tops of these things to um, anywhere that you see um, has been scratched or scraped or you start seeing a little rust or something along those lines you just go over it um, to hide any of um, the wear that's on there you can do that on the front and the rear of course like where we were just working like on these screws now everything on this is good to go except for the nut and as far as the nut goes if you want to know how to um, build a nut uh, on my YouTube channel on Will's Easy Guitar um, if you at my personal channel if you go there I have a video up that shows you exactly how to build nuts how to make your own guitar nuts um, and it's free so if you need to know how to do that it, it's there for the taking there's also one more thing I want to talk about before I go to the next guitar and that is your bridge and the radius on the bridge okay that's built in it or what's adjustable sometimes they're adjustable like on a fender it's adjustable but a rate the the fretboard typically has one measurement for the radius 12 inches 14 inch radius something along those lines sometimes they're compound radius okay which basically means maybe up here it's 16 and then down here it's 12 okay and your bridge needs to reflect that it needs to reflect this because if let's say for instance you have a 14 inch radius or a 12 inch radius on your bridge and your neck on the other hand is 16 inch radius you might have some strings closer to the fretboard um, than others okay and so the action height will be good on some of them but on other ones they'll be way way high if if for instance let's say that this was 16 inches a 16 inch radius right here and let's say that this was a 12 inch radius okay what that would mean is basically the two high E's you could get close to the fretboard but everything in the middle you couldn't right so it would have higher action in the middle there would be nothing you could do about that if this on the other hand was a 12 inch radius or a 9 inch radius or something like that and then this was maybe like 16 then the exact opposite is true what happens is you can get low action here but then the action out here is high okay so it's um, it's important that you you know you know what radius is you're dealing with and if it's the correct bridge there's been times people have sent me a guitar that they ended up changing the bridge out on and when they changed the bridge they had no idea what their radius was on the fretboard and they said I can't get the action right I can't get the intonation I can't get this could you do something 
and you look at it and you say it's the wrong bridge, right? Or it's the wrong it's the wrong radius. And so because of that, there's very little anybody can do unless you change the radius of the fretboard or you get the correct bridge, right? Generally the best bridges are the ones that you can actually adjust the radius on. And some people think you cannot adjust the radius on a Floyd Rose. You can, but it requires shims. But this is good to go, and I think we can go to the next guitar. So, this is an interesting one. Um, this is a Squire that someone had bought from a pawn shop uh, for $40. And they asked me if I could turn it into a very good Squire. And I said, yes, I can. So, everything has been taken apart on this. Okay. And we get all these screws out of here all the springs, get the bridge out of here. Um, this is a perfect example. Do you see this fretboard? This is a dry fretboard. This needs oil, okay? This is what happens when you use degreasers or whatnot to clean your fretboard. This is what happens when you might use something like alcohol to clean your fretboard. This is what happens when it's in a very dry environment. This is why you want to use oil every now and then to clean your fretboard. Uh, not to clean your fretboard, but to, um, in a way, rehydrate. And also, I want to show you something here. They say Fender makes quality instruments and they're great. Now, this is Squire, but it's still owned by Fender. Look at that um, fret marker. Do you see something wrong with it? That is way too far forward. That should be back here. I've seen that even on regular Stratocasters. I've seen it on Gibsons. You know, um, everything from the factory is not perfect. So, looking at this neck, we're going to be doing the same thing. Looking at this neck, I, I, I can't tell if this is gunk or if this is from where they ended up um, cleaning it. Okay, but. Um, I'm going to end up cleaning the fretboard just like I did earlier and putting an oil on it and I'm, right now what I'm doing is I'm holding this up at an angle and I'm looking at these frets to see if any of these frets are sticking out of the fretboard um, looking to see if I can see any dents in the frets um, anything that might be something that's going to end up creating a problem when it comes to trying to set this up Sometimes you have to do a fret job on, on something like this, okay? Um, but I think I can, I think this is okay. The, the frets are kind of low. They're no, they're, when you have low, small frets like this, they're known as vintage frets. Um, and as long as, as long as they're pretty close to being level, I can make this work, okay? So what I'm going to do is, just like I did before, I'm going to end up doing, uh, on this one, I'm going to do some liquid gold and um, spray it on there, let it set, and then clean it up. There's a little bit of dirt on there, but not a lot. Somebody had cleaned it with a degreaser. You can, you can tell because it sucked all the oil out of the top layer. Probably, um, yeah, there's something here, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. In cases like this, um, this is what I was talking about, you can kind of come in with a razor and remove the gunk that you see close to the fret. When you when you see a lot of it, sometimes you sometimes you can't really. What is that? Sometimes you can't scrub it off. Yeah, it's a little dirty, but not bad. Okay, now look at the difference between the color of this now compared to what it was. Okay, that that's how you can tell when you have a dry fretboard. Okay, some people say, how do you know when? Trust me, you know, it looks dry. And that is horrible for your guitar fretboard. You need to have a thin coat of oil on it. This right here, 
there's enough oil it's going to absorb and it's going to start um, dulling again probably in an hour it'll still look dark like this um, but it, it's going to absorb the oil that it ended up losing um, from when it was cleaned or whatever there's this fretboard is in pretty rough shape this is not the, um, fender net Fender never should have, or Squire, or whatever, they never should have used this piece of wood or they should have filled it because there's, you know, areas like this over here, um, there's gaps, there's gouges. There's a gouge right here, up in the, uh, near the fret up here, there is stuff missing. Um, they never should have used this, but it is what it is. There, there, you know, what when you're doing setups and stuff, um, all you you know you can bitch and moan all you want about how well they built something, um, but it's your job to overcome that, and um, this is going to have to be cleaned really well. But for for now, I can set this to the side. Um, now this looks like one of the. It looks like one of these guitars that somebody would get off eBay that, that somebody would claim was signed by somebody. Um, and it never is. It's always like the same signature. You know, it'll say, um, like, oh, this was signed by Eddie Van Halen, every member of Van Halen or something. And you, you look at all the signatures and they're all this, the same, <laughs> you know. Um, and people will always end up... Uh, trying to sell that guitar for hundreds and hundreds of dollars and usually it's always on a, the cheapest type of strat you can get and it's just a pick guard that's been signed and quite honestly I would never um, I, I would never purchase anything like that it you know it it's, it's junk now when you end up getting um, dirty knobs you can soak this in oxyclean and uh, clean these guys up there's a lot of there's a lot of junk that's on this fretboard I mean on this uh, pickguard I don't like um, and so this is all going to be removed I'm gonna I don't even know I can't even make out what that says it looks like it says Ro Higgins or Ken Ken Ham I, I have no idea what that says this screw is loose, so the toothpick trick would work really well for that right there. But I have to take this off and make sure that everything underneath is kosher. Same thing as before. I don't know if any of this works at all. Everything looks to be original. Um, it looks like it had been in a moist environment for a long time because I can see rust in different areas. Um, maybe it was by the beach or something. but. I'm going to come in here, spray the con contact cleaner. Um, I'm going to do the same thing inside the pots. A lot of times you don't need to change the pots, you just, you just need to clean them. Okay. After those are in, once again, back and forth, back and forth, trying to clean this guy up. This is a horrible switch. Once again, visual inspection. You're looking to see if there's any broken strings. You're looking to see if the solder joints are bad. You're, you're looking for anything that's bad. Also keep a really close eye on for ground, right? Make sure that things are grounded. Um, a lot of times somebody will not have a ground on their guitar and they'll be like, oh, I'm always getting this sound or I'm, you know, this, that, or the other thing and it's just like something's not grounded. And that happens more often than not. If you are going to have to clean a guitar body, I generally will use Windex. Um, and then afterwards, if I need to buff it or something, it will usually be fine. Um, in this case, I'm not going to really bother with the, the wax um, just because of the condition of the body. But I am going to clean this, this stuff up because it's nasty. Windex will take oil up 
and take dirt off, all that other stuff, and it'll leave it where it's streak free. Um, I'm going to let that soak in there because there's a lot of crud. Um, and I'm only going to do the top for now, and then later on I'll do the sides and the back. But uh, let that set for a second, and then come in here and try to get all this stuff off of here. Nobody wants to play a dirty guitar, and I don't want to work on one. <laughs> so um, I, try to, I try to clean this stuff up. So what I've got is my handy dandy Type Bond 2. Actually, it's too much glue. Let me kind of put that like this. And I'm going to break that piece off like that. Take the other side right here that's sharp, jam it in there. Do the exact same thing to this one. Break that off. That's another reason why I think that this is basswood. Because these stripped so easily. And basswood is very, very thin. I mean, it, it's it, not thin. It's, it's very uh, weak. It's not strong at all. So, cut these off flush about 15 minutes that glue will be dry and will be fine and you could do the exact same thing what I just did there for the neck so let's say somebody ends up saying hey one of these things is really doesn't grab very well you can just start stuffing a bunch of toothpicks inside there with um, uh, wood glue hammer them down in there then cut them off flush after it completely dries then um, you can go ahead and give it a shot and see if that will end up grabbing the screw. It usually works. And if not, then you have to drill it out. Now, I'm only going to be putting a couple in here right now in areas that I can see are fairly clean, like areas that are dirty. I'm not, I'm not going to really do it, and almost everything is dirty, but I just need two to kind of hold this in place. And once again, I'm going to, I'm going to, hit, the, I'm going to hit this with Windex. And don't worry, the Windex will not damage the pickups or anything like that. Yeah, this had this had to have been near an ocean or something, because um, well, I'm in California, but um, a lot of these metal parts are rusted, and they shouldn't rust that much unless they're near like salt water or a really moist environment. Um, I have seen people that have had guitars that they store next to their saltwater aquarium and their guitar becomes just a rust monster. So let me try something else to get this off. Well, some of the lighter solvents that I tried using really wasn't working, and I still have a little bit of residual where it, it, it kind of went in there. So it forces me to use something that's a little bit more nasty, which is going to melt the plastic a touch. Um, I can always wet sand and buff this, and any of that will disappear. Now, there's still a little bit of some stuff that doesn't look good, but I can always use like a little bit of this on there. And um, a little bit of uh, polishing compounds like this, I could go in with just a simple rag, just like this, and it will take out the majority of those little marks from the solvent. I can buff out a little bit more uh, later, but I can tell already that that's made a world of difference. So the next step is putting the screws back in. Ooh, look at that. Did you see how that just went right in there? This is another toothpick trick that we're going to have to do. Now we're going to the next step, and the next step is a, a Installing the tremolo. Now let's take a look at this tremolo. Um, ooh, rust, rust, rust. Look at all that rust. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a compressed air. I'm going to blow this out. Man, there's a lot of rust in that. And I'm going to hit this with three-in-one oil. And I'm going to let it. I'm going to let it absorb in all these, including the um, saddle 
uh, adjusters. I won't be able to set any intonation or any action height or anything like that if these are not going to be budging. So I'm, I'm really going to strafe the hell out of these um, screws and let it set. I can clean up the extra oil later. So I'm going to let that set for about 10 or 15 minutes and just let it kind of get inside there real well and then I'm going to take the, uh, the air compressor again and blow all that extra oil off and then I just have to wipe a little bit. And we'll go ahead and set this in place. And I'm hoping we're not going to have to do the toothpick trick for these guys. Now generally when you put these screws in you want you want to go you want to keep the the trim plate flat against the body okay and you you lower these until it touches the trim plate and it starts raising the rear of it like right there it starts raising the rear back it off until it's flush again to the to the body okay now there's some people that will um, have this up even higher, right? They, they kind of like their, their trim to set like this. I personally don't think that's a good idea. Um, not, with a, not with a fender, um, because a fender doesn't really do that well um, as a floating trim. Um, it's really hard to keep in tune unless you have like a roller nut and a r roller uh, string trees or string tees, depending on how you um, want to call it. Now, like this, what it does is it, it, it makes it where it's setting tight against the body, so you won't be able to do any... Uh, this one could use the toothpick trick. Um, and it's probably good enough, but it's kind of loose. Um, what it'll do is it'll allow to do dives, but when we put the string tension on it, the spring tension, it will always come back to its original position against the body. And it will make it where the um, uh, guitar stays in tune a lot better. One of the most frustrating things in the world is trying to get one of uh, a Fender style bridge to stay in tune. It can be done, but it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of finesse. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn all of these, making sure that they can freely move, which they can so far, which is good. Because when I start doing the adjustments on this for the intonation, I want to make sure I don't run into any problems. I want to do it now before there's a huge issue. And now we also have to lower all of these um, height adjusts. That's another problem I often see with a lot of these guitars is the way that they have these saddle height adjustment screws um, they're either too far out or they're too far in ideally you want them to be right around flush to the top and um, the way that you can make sure that happens is when you set the neck and I'll show you about setting the neck here in just a minute. If these are not even with one another, in other words, one side is higher than the other on, on these, what you're going to end up getting is a vibration sound. It's going to sound almost like fret buzz. So now that we have all of that, it's time to set the neck. Now I've, I've got these strings on here. I haven't removed any of the strings. And what I need to do is try to get this unwound and untangled um, so that way when I uh, put it on all the strings are exactly where they're supposed to be I'm gonna from here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lessen the string tension on these until I can get it um, to lower a little bit because that's too much tension that's currently on here like that now what I'm gonna do from here is I'm actually gonna start putting tension on the um, on the guitar, on on the strings, 
especially on the high E and the low E. And I'll explain why in just a second. I have it roughly where it belongs. I come back here and I want to make this, I want to make this um, not super tight, but I want it to, I, but I want it to be uh, somewhat tight. I want all of these to be in, but just not cranked down. Okay, so I have these, I have these uh, in there pretty well. Um, I want to get this to be tight against here, but not cranked, okay? Something like that. All right. So now that I've, I've got that in there, what I need to do is I need to adjust the angle of the neck, okay? And what I want to do is I want to make sure that the distance from the E to the outside here and the E to the outside here are the same. And I'm going to do that by grabbing the neck and shifting it back and forth. Okay, so now that that is in place, um, I'm going to release the tension on the, the strings now so I can put the springs on the uh, tram system. Some people will ask, um, should you ever put these at an angle? It depends. Putting them at an angle only increases the tension of the spring. Um, so you have to ask yourself, do you need to really increase the tension of it? Also, um, sometimes you have to add more than three springs. Sometimes three springs is too much tension and somebody will remove one. Um, messing around with the springs as far as their position, their length, the number of them, changes the way that the trim will feel. It changes the, the di dynamics of the, the tremolo. So you can experiment and find out what feels best for you. Generally three springs, fairly straight on, it is good enough. Now I would prefer to get this and put it over here, but because they put the ground on there, I don't think that this is going to sit there well. And anytime somebody uses a trim, it might rub against that and make a noise. Sometimes people will also complain about the springs making too much noise. What you can do is take a rubber tube, like surgical tubing, and run it through the springs, and that will make it where the, it deadens the springs and it silences them. Okay? So what we'll do now, I don't know if, let me take this, this cover off. I'm not even sure why it's on. Uh, toothpick trick for that. Yeah, this has got to be basswood. It's too soft to be anything else. Um, what in the hell is this? <laughs> There's all sorts of stuff on here. Okay, so I don't know if this is going to be the proper spring tension until I actually bring these up to tune. Okay, when I bring these up to pitch, the nut is bad. I can already tell this high E is horrible. Uh, it keeps wanting to come off. So I'm going to uh, plug, plug this in and I'm going to bring all this up to pitch. Okay, so we have all of these adjusting uh, screws flush to the top and ideally that's where they they should be real close to that so they're not digging into anybody's hand and also uh, they're not sticking way way up um, either because that's that's awkward but the problem is the action here is ridiculously high okay so this is where back angle of the neck starts coming into play things that have a set neck like a like a Les Paul or something they already have a back angle, and those are typically about two degrees or so. And um, when you have a bolt on neck and you have to put a back angle on it, um, there's a couple ways you can do it, but generally the, the easiest way that works um, is putting a shim in the very, very front of this. Um, some people will use hard cardboard, like something you'd get off of a cereal box, um, and it, it works. Um, but I generally will use thin pieces of veneer, um, and it doesn't take a lot. It, you know, something, you know, maybe about like that is more than enough. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to take the neck off again, and I'm going to, I'm going to put a shim inside the pocket and tighten it back down and give this a slight back angle. Some people are worried that when you you do that, it's going to affect the tone in some way, or it's going to affect the sustain, and it doesn't. Okay, 
so don't worry about that. Um, but this is just entirely too high. And what I want to do is when the back angle, when I, when I shim this, I want this to be pretty close to the strings. You, you know, uh, uh, the fret's pretty close to the string. Not touching, but pretty close to it. And then that will give me room to uh, do the adjustments over here. But I don't want to do anything with intonation or anything or action height until I get that shim inside there. You'll see that this is a common problem where people either have too large of a shim and it causes the saddles to be way, way too high or what happens is they don't have enough of one and then they lower this and then these poke their hands. So let me remove the neck and I'll show you uh, basically how I go about doing this. So I have the neck off and now I have a piece of veneer and what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this piece and just break it off or fold it, doesn't make a difference, where both of these pieces are going to be setting just like that. And um, without tightening the neck, I'm going to put this back in and see if that is going to be enough height there uh, to give me the back angle that I need when I push down on this. And you'll see by me just putting that one little p the, that one little bit in there, this is almost touching the strings and in some case uh, the frets and in some cases it is. So I'm going to say that that is good and I'm going to go ahead and tighten the neck back down. So now that I've, I've got that done you'll see that um, the action is still a little bit high but it it, it's not going to take me a lot to mess around with the uh, bridge to set the action height on this. Um, but it's a lot better. It probably wouldn't hurt to even just put one more little piece inside there but I'm going to see how far I can get with this. As long as the uh, saddles um, do not protrude too much, we should be okay. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and get this in tune. And after I get this in tune, I'm going to go ahead and set the intonation. Okay, so <clears throat> I have this, this uh, pretty close to being in tune. It doesn't have to be perfectly in tune. And now what I'm going to do is, before I set the intonation, I'm going to try to lower the action as much as I can. And how I'm going to determine what the proper height of the action is going to be is in a, the playing position, I'm going to be just going up each fret trying to hear any type of fret buzz. If I don't hear any fret buzz, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to lower I'm going to lower the saddle a little bit. And I'm going to keep doing that until I hear fret buzz. As soon as I hear fret buzz, I'm going to raise the saddle a little bit until it goes away. And then that way I know I have the uh, optimum height for the action. It's as low as I can get it. And I'm going to do that for each one of these. As soon as I have that done, then I can go ahead and start pulling around with the intonation. But right now, the most important thing is trying to get this action height done. You don't want to set the intonation before the action height. As soon as you set the action, uh, if you do that and you start fooling around with the action height, your intonation is going to go out. Okay. So, uh, like I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through on each note, just like this. And when I and uh, keep doing it, um, listening for fret buzz. If I don't hear any, I'm going to lower the uh, the saddle. Now, also make sure that your neck is straight, so your neck is exactly like it's supposed to be uh, before you start doing this. And uh, as soon as I do, as soon as I'm done with this, uh, we'll start doing the intonation. Okay, so I went ahead and I did that, and I lowered all the saddles. Um, and as low as I could get them and uh, measuring at the 12th fret right here I'm actually getting a sixteenth of an inch uh, between the uh, bottom of the E string and the top of the fret which is actually pretty good um, and so this is this is pretty low action right here 
and there's a couple of spots that I'm getting ever so slight fret buzz but um, it's it's not bad enough that I have to sit there and worry about it it's it's very 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 slight and when you as soon as you'd plug this in to an amp you you wouldn't hear any of it um, so sometimes a very very small amount of fret buzz is okay um, it's just when it, it's real pronounced and um, also it's um, kind of deadening the string a little bit that's when you have to worry about it but right now the way that I have this the action height is good so the next step that now is getting all of these in tune um, and as soon as all of these are in tune I'm going to start adjusting the intonation now just like before what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that this string is exactly at E when it's open and then I'm going to fret the 12th and I'm going to hit it again and see where it's at amazingly enough it's it's right it's about where it's supposed to be let me try the A, and the A is about where it's supposed to be, so is the D, now this, this nut is horrible. These are actually almost right on the money, um, just by sheer coincidence, which is really bizarre. Um, but just like before, if it were to be sharp, when I were to do the 12th fret, then what I would do is I would, I would screw this tighter and bring the saddle back this way. Um, and if it, if it was um, something that was flat, then what I would do is I would loosen the screw and have it have the saddle go in this direction and I would do that on each one of these um, but interestingly enough they're all right around exactly where they're supposed to be um, so I'm going to end up doing the fine tuning on this with the strobe tuner um, I'm actually surprised um, that that turned out just by sheer chance that it's exactly where it's supposed to be. Now let's go ahead and talk a little bit about string tees or sting, uh, string trees depending on who you talk to. Now the purpose of these guys is if you notice the height of where the string goes into the tuner okay, is almost the same height as the nut okay and because of this we, we we might get a sitar sound we might not get a really full clean tone when we're playing so in order for us to um, uh, make everything sound just right and uh, not have these actually pop out of their respective place in the nut what we do is we get these and we stick them underneath the uh, string tree or string T basically like that okay now on a trim system what that usually means is this is going to be a binding point okay there's going to be friction on these and the friction is going to make it when you start tuning it it's going to grab here and you're going to have to kind of move these back and forth and squeeze to loosen that friction and uh, you know repeatedly do that um, until you can actually get your string in tune because if you don't what might happen is you're going to keep cranking and cranking and cranking and cranking and nothing is you're not going to see any change on the tuner and then all of a sudden it's going to go clink and then it's going to go sharp okay and the friction here is one of the main reasons why um, a non-locking tremolo like a, a Fender style tremolo is so horrible 
Um, and the same with right here, we have friction within the nut slots. Uh, and the way that we can kind of overcome that is we can actually install roller trees or roller tees, just depends once again on who you're talking to, what they're going to call them. And the rollers help uh, get rid of that uh, friction, okay? And some people will put a roller nut on too in order to get rid of some of that friction. Um, you can put graphite with inside the nut slots, that works. You can even put um, a little bit of beeswax underneath the uh, string tree inside here in these areas and that will help a little bit. Um, if, depending on the, the type of neck you have and depending on the kind of tuners you have, if the strings will stay in the nut slot um, without having this be active, in other, uh, in other words, if you could have it like that, it's better to have it like that if you're going to be using the trim, okay? Because it reduces the, the friction, it gets rid of it. And you have a much greater chance of your guitar staying in tune when you do a dive and stuff like that. Now, um, the way that this neck is built and, and everything like that, um, I'm going to have to use these uh, string trees. So I can put a little bit of beeswax underneath there. I can even use graphite. Graphite's going to end up kind of wearing out. Sometimes people will put three-in-one oil underneath it on the string just to help uh, prevent some of that. Um, but these guys are usually a culprit for why your Strat will not stay in tune. Um, it only costs a couple dollars to get rollers uh, for these and it makes a world of difference. So if somebody's having a lot of problems with it stay, uh, staying in tune, this is the very first thing that you should think about replacing. The next thing that you should think about replacing is the nut. Now this nut needs to be replaced. This is, this is horrible. Um, the E is very loose inside here and it wants to keep popping out. So this nut I'm going to have to replace. So after I retuned it, I um, double checked the intonation and I saw that these two guys were actually a little out. So I brought them further back this way and now they're good to go. So this is uh, pretty much set up. I do have to replace the nut on it. Um, but there's one thing that we haven't checked. Now, I mean, I do have to clean the knobs and put the knobs back on. But there's one thing I haven't checked yet, and that's the electronics, because this was taken apart when um, I got it. So now I have to plug it in and make sure all the pickups um, sound the way that they're supposed to sound, and also make sure that the, the pots are working the way that the pots are supposed to be working, and adjust the pickup height just like I um, did in the other videos. You'll notice um, on this particular guitar, let me come in, let me zoom in right here, okay, that this is still flush against the body. This is still flush, okay? Now that means that there's enough spring tension. If this were to have, start angling forward this way, it would be a sign that what we should do is actually tighten the springs a little bit. Now what I'm going to do after I know everything is set up and everything's perfect, I'm, I'm going to start uh, loosening the springs, the spring tension in the back um, until this wants to start moving forward ever so slightly and then I'm going to tighten them down a little bit more. I want to have the tension up here on the strings be the same on the springs and the tension gets adjusted by these two screws right here. So after everything is said and done I'm, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start reducing the spring tension um, so that way if I do do a dive or something along those lines with the guitar here I don't have to you know put Superman strength behind it it'll it'll dive easy but when I let go the springs will have enough tension that it'll suck it right back into uh, the position that it's currently in and that's important so here's a couple of tips though 
um, to try to keep your Strat in tune a little bit better. The very first thing is always stretch your strings. Um, you want to stretch these guys out before um, you start playing it. Right? Just like I was showing you earlier, you grab and you bend. Another thing that you can do is you can grab a piece of wood or something that is hard um, that is uh, blunt. And right up here next to the um, saddle, you want to push down on the string. And by doing that, you're going to be putting a kink in it right there. But what that does is, um, well, it's going to stretch a uh, string, so I'm going to have to retune after this. But what it does is it kind of locks them in place right here. So if you do do a dive, um, they'll be more prone to stay in this position and they won't kind of get loose in that block uh, underneath this. So that's a good tip. Um, so now we have to check the electronics on this and make sure that everything sounds okay. So these are single coils and they're going to be picking up RF signals. They're going to always be picking up some type of hum. And with uh, a battery powered amp, um, it helps a little bit, but I have fluorescent lights above me, and that's what we're hearing inside the, um, the amp. So I, I set this to the bridge position, and this is out of tune because I did push down on these, but that's okay. And you're, we can hear that the, the low end is much stronger and more present than the high. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to raise the treble side and I'm going to lower the bass side. The batteries are dying in my amp. That's why it sounds distorted. You raise this up just a touch. Now that I have this where about where I want it, and once again, lowering it's going to make it cleaner, but the output is going to drop. Bringing it up is going to uh, have the output. Uh, increase but it's going to start getting muddy and if you start getting too close it's going to start sounding like warbly so uh, be careful with that find your happy your happy spot that sounds good to me so now I'm going to come up here and raise this up just a little bit there is something very very wrong with this and that's one of the reasons why I couldn't get everything to sound quite right and at the same volume. If I put this all in the bridge position and I tap on these pole pieces, I'm not getting anything. If I come over here, I'm getting it on the middle pickup, right? If I bring this over to the center, and I'm not getting anything over there. So, okay, so the pick guard has to come off. I have to look at what in the world is going on here. I have a feeling somebody tried to rewire this and they didn't know what they were doing, but no matter what, um, this should be on that, this position, and this should not be on that position. That's, that's just craziness. Um, I was wondering why I couldn't get the um, I couldn't get the uh, volume to be right when I was moving these things back and forth, and I was wondering why it sounded strange. It's because a maniac was using this uh, that adjusted it last. So I'm going to have to take off the strings, which is which is fine because they needed to be replaced anyway. And I have to take the pick guard off again and examine the electronics because that is simply crazy. 
And when you're doing setups for other people, you never know what you're going to get. Sometimes they say, I haven't, I haven't done anything, I haven't adjusted anything. Uh, everything's factory. And you, you, op you open it up and you look in there and you could tell somebody messed with it. Um, and they just were too embarrassed to tell you that, um, well, they, they basically messed it up. Now these pickups look fairly original and the wiring looks to be about right. But there's one thing that is uh, different. You'll notice that this is white, this is white, this is black. And the problem that we're having is this and this need to be swapped. Okay. And I'm assuming that the reason why this is black and this is white is because it, the manufacturer is trying to tell you which side is north and which side is south. So that way um, you end up getting some hum cancellation when you end up putting um, you know, the middle position between these two pickups and between these two pickups. Now let me see. Let me see if I'm right. So I've got my compass here and it's pointing north right there. And if I come over here that's pointing south. Okay. So yeah. Okay, so that's exactly what's going on. Somebody ended up taking these pickups out and then they just moved them around into the wrong position. So let me I don't know why somebody would do such a thing. Now let's say for instance this is a pickup that has staggered pole pieces which is quite common for Strat type uh, guitars where this would be low, this would be kinda low, these two would be sticking up this would be lower than all of them and then this one would be higher than that one that would go to the B string okay? and you would want to put this back in um, so it would be set up exactly like it's supposed to be. If you have this thing flipped upside down where the staggered piece was, uh, you know, at the A string, um, it would sound funny. It wouldn't quite sound right. So you'd have to pay attention to that as well. Now this particular guitar has springs underneath the screws and for the pickups and sometimes there'll be surgical tubing uh, there to act as the spring instead of an actual spring. Um, so let me make sure all the wires are where they're supposed to be. Um, and sometimes those deteriorate. Uh, so you'll want to keep it, you'll want to look for that and if you see it's deteriorated you're going to want to go ahead and, and uh, change them out because if not what's going to end up happening is when you try to adjust the pickup height um, you're, you're going to have problems. This feels like something is yeah, is getting in the way. There we go. So let's go ahead and test this again. So do you hear the, the, the um, hum cancellation? Single coil, no hum, but these two are active, hum cancellation. That's active. Okay. So everything now should be much easier to adjust. Okay, so now that now that the pickups have been put in the way that they're supposed to be put in, the only thing I should have to do now is just change the strings, put a new set of strings on, and um, tune it up, and everything should be fine at this point. Now, um, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about your tuning machines here. These, th this tuning machine is very loose, okay, because these are cheap. Um, they're not some of the best tuning machines in the world. Now, when you have a tuning machine that is very loose like this, um, what can happen is it will not really want to stay in tune because there's a lot of play in there uh, between the gears. So, you know, you might have to kind of turn it and then bring it back and turn it and bring it back and things like that in order to get the thing to be in tune. Um, 
if it becomes a problem, it's better just to change the tuners. Buy new tuners, put them in. Um, there, there's some people out there that say, oh, you never have to replace tuners. That is a crock. Sometimes you have to replace them if they're poorly made. Like this E, there's a lot of tension on this compared to this one where it's, it's very, very loose. Um, sometimes, let's go ahead and flip this guy, okay? Sometimes you'll actually have to take these off and then oil inside there. Um, every now and then. Sometimes you won't be able to oil inside there depending on who, who manufactured them and how they made them. But uh, just keep that in mind. Sometimes uh, you will have to put some oil on the tuners. You'll know when you need to. So um, I'm going to change the strings on this. I'm going to put new strings. Adjust the pickups um, like I was doing earlier change the batteries in the, the little amplifier and then after that this is finished all I have to do is clean it and um, we're good to go on this one so now we can go to the next guitar one thing I want to talk about before I put this uh, the strings on tune it up and put this guitar away is another problem that sometimes happens and I should cover that and that's when a fret comes loose and when a fret comes loose it'll be sticking up and you'll know because there'll be a gap underneath it. Now usually you can just take a, a, a small hammer, hammer it back in, hopefully it stays. If it doesn't stay because the wood has been damaged, what you can do is lift, gently lift the fret up, put super glue underneath it, and then clamp it down. And clean up the super glue with acetone and clamp it down and wait for about a minute or two take the clamp off and it should stay in place um, that does happen every now and then also another thing that can happen is when the frets will actually kinda start sticking out this happens due to um, the environment uh, changing temperature and moisture so if it gets real hot and dry the neck might shrink this way and when it shrinks that direction these guys can protrude a little bit and kind of want to cut the players hands when that happens you can use a small file to kind of round those edges over or even an emery board and just kind of go down the side of it put a piece of tape or something there to protect the the side of the the fretboard but just gently sanding it or taking a small file and rounding over once again when it comes to fretwork um, I'm not going to be going over any of that here in this video because in the guitar building course I show you how to do a complete fret job, how to do all the leveling and everything. And it's about two hours long and if I were to add it into this video, the, the video would be just too long. So um, if you need more information about the, the fretting and stuff, uh, go to the guitar building course. If you haven't already purchased it, you can purchase it on uh, the Galvin Guitars website on the products page. There's uh, currently there's seven videos um, and there might be some more in the future um, and it covers pretty much everything you would ever need to know to build your own guitar and to do fret work and to build your own necks and stuff like that. And this video is a great complement to th those videos and vice versa. Hopefully you won't have to do much fret work on your setups. Um, but if you do, those videos do have the information that you're looking for. So last but not least, uh, we'll be doing my biocaster for a setup. Okay, And this has been setting and moisture um, and temperature has changed dramatically here in San Diego. And because of that, um, I'm going to need to do a truss rod adjustment. You need to be able to identify when it's a truss rod adjustment or if it's a bad fret. Now, if I'm down here playing, now this is out of tune right now, um, but if I'm down here playing like an A, you can hear fret buzz. If I play a bar chord on a C, we get fret buzz fret buzz on the E. If I do an A, okay, it goes away. 
So as I start moving up the fretboard, it goes away, which tells me that the which tells me that the neck right here has a slight back bow in it. Okay, so this is this is a this is adjusted with a truss rod adjustment. Okay, a simple truss rod adjustment will take that um, that fret buzz out. And to confirm uh, my suspicions, which I'm absolutely positive of, if I place my straight edge on the neck, it will um, it it will teeter. So it's going to be moving back and forth like this, which is a dead sign that we have a back bow. And when I when I hold this perfectly flat up here, it's it's straight, and then it and it touches the frets, and then it goes backward. Okay. So all I have to do is a simple truss rod adjustment, and it will take care of that. Before I adjust the action, which I won't need to, but before I do that, I have to make sure that my uh, fretboard is straight. You always do your truss rod adjustments before you start doing anything else. Make sure that it's tuned to pitch or close to pitch. So the, the, the tension on the strings um, is pretty much what it's supposed to be at. And then you match the tension um, with the fret on the, with, for the neck with the truss rod to the tension of the strings. If you drop down, let's say you do drop tuning. If you do drop tuning, what can end up happening is you're reducing the tension on the strings. And this can actually cause a slight back bow because the, the tension in the truss rod is stronger than that. And so it has a tendency to tilt back. So make sure that you don't automatically assume that the frets are not level. Do a truss rod adjustment. Okay. One of the problems that people have when they're dealing with um, Floyd Rose trims is a lot of times they'll they'll sit there and they'll they'll um, get everything tuned in tune before they do the locking nut, and then as soon as they push down on the locking nut, as soon as they tighten this, everything goes sharp. Okay. Now that usually happens because they do not have this piece right here. Okay. That's what this piece is for. What it does is it lowers the strings to the same height as all of the uh, tuning machines. But also what it does is it, put, it forces the strings down onto the nut. If this was gone, these would be sticking up high. And when you end up cranking these down, it would actually stretch the strings. So the height of this right here is important and it can be adjusted with these two screws and you want it to be at the exact same height as the um, tuning machines. Now as far as the nut slot height on something like this you can't go in with a file. This is hardened steel you can't go in with a file. Um, so the only way that you can make sure that this is the correct height either you know down enough or up enough is either routing out the wood so you can lower it or by putting shims underneath it and you usually will put it like a metal shim and you can put a shim maybe on if it's just this side that's low you can put a shim underneath it here and leave this side normal um, but if you get if you get fret buzz because this is too low uh, to the fretboard you just unscrew these two lift it up put a couple of shims underneath it crank it back down and that will take care of it the dreaded Floyd Rose now a lot of people are terrified of these things. They hate them because they don't know how to set them up. And it's not as, com it's not as complicated as people make it out to be. Um, the very first thing um, is the action height is adjusted by the pole pieces. Okay, So you would raise these up or down and then this would end up raising the bridge up and down. Just like the tunematic bridge. right? Um, now, it's important that when you do that, that these guys are fairly close to being the same. You wouldn't want this thing to be tilting like this, like extreme, because if it, well, you should never have to do that. But if you ended up doing that, it would kind of jam this thing and it would kind of lock in and, and have um, friction there that is unnecessary and it could make clanking noises. So try to get them fairly close to the same uh, height. The second thing is your fine tuning is done right here. This is where you do all of your fine tuning. You want these to be set about halfway 
okay? Do all of your um, string adjustments and everything along those lines. After you have everything perfectly in tune and your intonation is done, then you lock down the uh, nut. It's going to go slightly out of tune and you use these to fine tune it. The saddles are adjusted with the intonation by loosening one of the whatever saddle it is, these screws and bringing, moving this thing back and forth. One of the problems with the Floyd Rose that makes it a little frustrating is you have to loosen the string, right? So you have to remove the locking nut um, clamp so that way the string is loosened and then you end up um, unwinding it and so there's no tension on the string. You have to kind of remember exactly where the um, saddle was pull back on it and then tighten it back down again. There are three holes on each saddle which will allow this to have different positions. Okay, So if you have to have this thrown way far forward you would end up taking this screw out and moving it to the very front hole. Okay, If it's somewhere in the middle you use the middle hole and if it's something where you have to bring this very far back you use the rear hole. Just like the fender trim that we did earlier the Floyd Rose trim should be level with the body, okay? It, it should never look like this, okay? It should never look like that. Um, and it should never be, you know, all the way back either, okay? Now, the way that I have this one set up is it can't really do too many pull-ups because um, I like having this blocked so every time that I let go of it, it goes back into exactly where it's supposed to be and it's in tune and everything like that. Now if you were going to have this floating, which basically means you can do dives and you can pull back, um, it, can, it, it can still be done fairly easy, okay? But um, until the strings have been stretched all the way and they're not going to stretch anymore, um, it's going to be going out of tune a lot, okay? So, and that's a number one thing on a lot of these trim systems is people do not stretch their strings. And they're saying, it's so hard to keep it in tune. Stretch your strings. The way that you put the strings in on these is when you get your new string where the ball end is, you just snip it off, okay? And then you put your string in there and then you, you, you uh, clamp it in. Now after you um, have all of this stuff done and you're starting to tune this guy up, okay? You're starting to get this, starting to get this guy in tune. Um, you might notice that it'll start coming forward like this. Okay, this means the springs behind this are not strong enough. You have to, you have to get the the springs and start putting more tension on them by um, tightening those screws in the back. Okay, and what you can do is put something underneath the Floyd. Um, thin piece of wood, some folded up cardboard, it, it doesn't make a difference. You stick something underneath the Floyd so it can't go back, okay? And then you want to tighten, you want to over tighten the springs on the rear, okay? So this is constantly being forced back. You, you bring all of your uh, strings up to pitch and the spring tension will be more than this, the string tension. And when after that happens and everything's perfectly in tune, you can push this forward, take those pieces out, set it back down, and everything's going to go sharp, okay? But then what you do is you slowly start releasing the tension on those springs until this guy starts becoming level and it's back in tune, okay? That, when that happens, you know that the spring tension and the string tension are at an equilibrium. And that's the number one problem with uh, people doing Floyd Rose adjustments. They don't know how to adjust the springs. Now looking at looking at mine, I can tell that the spring adjustment, um, I have to release the spring just a little bit. And when I say just a little bit, we're talking a quarter of a turn on, on only one of the screws. That might be more than enough. Um, you don't want to be sitting there trying to, you know, do 15 turns on the screw and releasing a lot of it. Just a quarter of a turn, test it, you know, quarter of a turn, test it. And you keep doing that until you find equilibrium. As soon as you find equilibrium, you'll never really have to adjust it again. 
um, as long as you're using the same gauge strings. As soon as you change the string gauge, the tension changes. And when the tension changes, the spring tension is going to be out, and you're going to have to do maybe a quarter of a turn um, here or there in order to bring everything back up to normal. But all trims should be parallel to the body. They should be flat. And this one, I can, like I said, I can tell it's ever so slightly... Um, the springs are ever so slightly um, tight. Floyd Rose Bridges are set at a 14 inch radius. Now 14 inch radius will generally work for a 16 inch radius and it will also work for a 12 inch radius. But sometimes people will put these on a guitar that has maybe like a 10 inch radius or maybe they want it to even be more flat for a 16. Okay, The way that that is done is these get released and you, you would do this first and underneath these you would put thin metal shims okay thin metal shims underneath each one of these to set the uh, radius the way that you need it usually the two in the middle you don't have to do anything to it's going to be these two out guy, outside guys that would be for like a 16 inch radius if it was for a 12 inch radius I'm sorry a 10 inch radius then you would be putting them here here and here but mostly here what you can use for the shim for these guys is simply an aluminum can from a coke bottle that you cut into strips that can fit underneath here and just they're thin enough that it, it'll give it just a little bit of a lift and if you need to add more you can always add more as long as it's metal you'll be fine when you buy a Floyd Rose bridge um, it will come with pieces of steel and these pieces of steel that go inside there is specifically for the adjustment um, of changing the radius. If you can set up one guitar like a Fender Strat, there is no reason why you can't set up pretty much every single guitar that's out there because the principles are the same. Nothing really changes. Maybe the bridge design changes a little bit or the nut changes a little bit, but ultimately everything is the same. So for basic setups and basic troubleshooting um, this pr pretty much concludes this video. There are some things that happen when you're when you're doing repairs where you start seeing twisted necks and bent necks and you see where maybe the neck um, uh, that is set ha was installed in the wrong spot. You know you, you do find things like that. Um, but in this video, that would go way beyond uh, this video. This video is setups and basic troubleshooting. That would be guitar repair, right? Um, like extreme cases of that, which happens sometimes. Um, but it goes beyond the scope of this video. So that's that. And hopefully you learned something from this. And until next time, I'm William Galvin, and I will talk to you later.